The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this month's edition of the Psych Central webinar series. Just a couple of housekeeping items. Remember, we cannot see you, uh, so don't raise your hand or talk to the screen. We won't be able to answer. But if you do have questions, please type them into the question or chat window, and I will moderate the questions at the end of our presenter's presentation. You can enter them anytime. Don't worry, the presenter won't see them, but I will, and I will ask him then. Gabriel, are you ready to begin? Gabriel, I am ready to begin. Excellent. The floor is yours. Oh, my goodness. Um, well, first of all, before I begin, I want to thank um, Gabe Howard, and I want to thank Psych Central um, for having me host this webinar. This is my inaugural webinar. This is it, 38 years old, and I've made it this far in uh, quasi-professional life without having to do a webinar. Um, but those days are over uh, because here we are, you and me together online in webinar land. And the subject of this webinar is um, telling your mental health recovery story. And the title, as you can see right there, is ready to tell your story with a question mark in parentheses. Clever, huh? Um, because a lot of what we're going to be talking about today is um, readiness to tell your mental health recovery story. Um, and there's a lot of things that I have to say about that, and we will get to that. Um, I am the editor-in-chief of OC87 Recovery Diaries. Um, we tell stories of mental health empowerment and change. You can find us online at oc87recoverydiaries.org. Don't go there now. Stay here now. Be good. Um, you can always go there later um, when you're supposed to be on your lunch break, unless, of course, that's what you're supposed to be doing now. Anyway, on with the presentation. So I thought that it would be great if you um, knew a little bit about me because it, it is all about me. So I'm going to be sitting here talking to you for the better part of an hour. So I thought you should know a little bit about who this guy is who's kind of talking in your ear. Um, so a little bit about me. Uh, I am a Jewish Santa Claus. Um, those do exist, Virginia, just so you're aware of that. Uh, I'm also a jester and a, uh, an actor. Um, my, my bachelor's degree is in theater, and I have a Master of Arts in Education degree. Both of those degrees are largely irrelevant in my professional life, um, but in my amateur life, they, they somehow bear, bear fruit. Um, what else am I? Uh, I'm also a child. Um, I think that we're all a little bit of a child, and who we were as children definitely informs who we are as adults, our childhood experiences, how we looked at the world when we were, I think I was in kindergarten um, when I made that. It's a wood block um, and uh, there are, those are actual nails in there that they had us hammer. Um, my kids are in kindergarten now and they do different projects. Um, no more giving six-year-old children hammers and uh, potentially rusty hardware. Uh, what else am I? I'm a father of two. Um, so there they are. Those are my children. And those were some very dark, and I might add, very skinny days um, for them and for me. That picture was taken at 4 a.m., uh, just to give you a little bit of context there. And who else am I? I am an editor. <laughs> so um, sometimes that's how I dress when I edit, um, sometimes not uh, how I'm dressed today. Well, it's none of your business. That's what a webinar is. You just uh, aren't going to get to know. I guess my point in, in this particular slide is letting you know that I'm a lot of different things. Um, you know, your business card says whatever it says. Uh, you're a program assistant. You're a development specialist. You're uh, an editor-in-chief. Whatever. Um, I'm a lot of different things, and so are you. And so... Let's switch gears from me to you. So when you're thinking about writing your mental health recovery story, I think one of the most valuable things that you can think about is who am I? Um, what do you want people to know about you? And I think that that's something very important to consider. So think about a mental health recovery story as your introduction to your reader. It's, um, I do a lot of operettas and musicals, and think about the first number that the cast performs uh, when the curtain parts or rises. 
that is their handshake to the audience, right? So I want you to think about how you would start your mental health recovery essay and what would you tell people? What would you want them to know about you? How do you want to introduce yourself to the world? Ah, these two questions seem to be very contradictory. What do you want people to know about you and what do you fear people will know about you? There is an element of fear um, at work, I think in all writing and particularly in the realm of mental health storytelling, uh, it's scary. It is scary to disclose. It is scary to talk about what is going on in your mind and in your heart. Um, and you're right to feel scared about that. But that fear is an integral part of your mental health recovery story. It's not something that you should let limit you. It's something that you should acknowledge is there and you should think about and think about why. Why do they certain things about you, about yourself, scare you? So for instance, um, I live with anxiety. I live with depression. Um, I live with obsessive compulsive um, tendencies. And those are scary to talk about. Or at least, I guess when I first started in this realm, they were scary to talk about. And I had to do a lot of thinking about why. Why was I scared to open up about depression? Um, why was I scared to talk or write about my anxiety? Um, why was I feeling like afraid about talking about things that I obsess over? Um, okay, let's take the obsessions for a second. Um, I obsess about some pretty weird stuff. Um, and just that statement right there, I obsess about some pretty weird stuff. There's a lot of judgment there. There's a lot of shame there. And judgment and shame, that's part of our personal experience. And sometimes those feelings are put upon us um, by others, by adults in our life. Um, some of it is uh, placed on ourselves by ourselves, but I think it's something to acknowledge. Um, and if you think about it, others out there who might be reading your work are dealing with shame, they're dealing with secrets, they're dealing with stigma as well. So by you acknowledging that fear about what is inside of you and choosing to write about it anyway, you're doing a great service to the people who are going to read your work and we're gonna talk about that more um, later. So thinking more about yourself, what makes you quirky, interesting, or unique? So I touched on this a little bit um, in the first slide when I was talking about myself and showing all the different ridiculous get-ups that I have. I mean, my, my costume is like, uh, my, my costume, my closet is like a veritable repository of very strange clothes. Um, and they're all kind of a reflection of different pieces of myself. So I want you to think about your closet and not just your literal closet, but your, your closet inside of you. What is in there? Kind of wander into that closet um, right now. Just close your eyes for a second and open that door and turn on the light and see what's in there. When you're writing, you're kind of sifting through the detritus of your life. You're sifting through the interesting, you're sifting through the bizarre, you're sifting through the painful, um, the unique, the quirky, um, all to find a moment that you think is worth sharing with a reader. Um, so as you're rooting around in that closet, there are stories to tell in there. And some of those stories are kind of out in the open on hangers, and some of those stories are stuffed in little boxes, right? Go for the stories that are stuffed in the boxes. Um, the, the boxes that you don't feel like opening. Um, that's where I think that you should be going. That's where the most interesting stories lie. Um, so be thinking about that. There's nobody on this earth who is boring. There is nobody on this earth who is devoid of stories. There is nobody on this earth who is bereft of experiences that someone else can't benefit from. So think about your stories. Think about what you have been through and what you have gone through that you can share with someone in a hopeful and meaningful way.
what do you like to read? This is one of the first questions that you should be asking yourself um, when you sit down to write your mental health recovery story. What do you like to read? What gets you thinking? What gets you smiling? What gets you laughing? What gets you crying? Um, what makes you emotional? Storytelling, if it's nothing else, it's an emotional connection between you and another person who you may never meet. Um, so in order to impact that other person, that reader, that uh, middle-aged woman in Des Moines, that uh, executive in Manhattan, uh, that father of twins in southeastern Pennsylvania, you need to think about what moves you uh, before you can think about what is going to move some other person who you don't even know. So think about what you read, think about why you read it, um, and then really kind of go from there. I'm not telling you that you should be kind of copying another author's uh, style, but definitely think about, you know, what is it that moves you? I mean, I'll tell you right now, sorry, sip of tea, not feeling well today. Um, an author who moves me is Dave Eggers. And I read uh, his first book, A Heartbreaking Work of Stagger and Genius, um, I think when I was in my early 20s. And it changed the way that I wrote. It changed the way that I looked at the world. Um, it, is an, an, it is a heartbreaking book, and it is staggering, and it is genius. Um, and it is incredibly painful, but also ridiculously beautiful. Um, and so you want to find those kind of works that are really kind of pivotal um, in the way in which you experience literature in, in order to make great writing. And the final question that I think you should be asking yourself, what would you only tell to your closest friend? So this again sounds kind of, kind of counterintuitive because I was talking about, well, your reader is this person in Des Moines or this person in New York or this person in Pennsylvania who you don't know. Right, you don't know your reader, um, and you won't know your reader until you know maybe you're a very very famous writer and you're able to do Google Analytics and and know everything about who's reading your work. But until then, let's operate on the assumption that you're kind of writing and sending things out into the ether, and, and whoever's picking it up is picking it up. You want to be writing in the style, um, it, particularly for mental health recovery essays. Certainly not for for every other genre, but for mental health recovery essays as if you're sitting right next to your closest friend and it's two o'clock in the morning and you're opening up, you're making yourself vulnerable. You are choosing to put yourself out there because you're in a trusting relationship. And that is the kind of way that I think is the most effective way to write. Um, when you are um, giving of yourself to someone else. And that is very, very hard to do um, when you're not with your closest friend because you don't know what the response is going to be. And we're going to talk about um, feedback uh, a little later in this presentation and we're going to talk about trolls and all that kind of stuff. But be brave, uh, be bold, and be true. So where do I begin? Why, at the very beginning, of course, right? Thank you, Julie Andrews, and thank you, little children. Um, why? Why do you want to tell your mental health recovery story? And people do things for all different kinds of reasons. Um, but I'm going to go out there on a limb and guess that you don't want to tell your mental health recovery story because you think it will bring you fame and fortune. Uh, because I'm here to tell you that it most likely will not, and that's okay. So I think having realistic expectations is very important, and being truly honest with yourself about why you want to tell your mental health recovery story. Um, and not just why you want to tell that story, but why now. Yeah, so here's the question that I get asked a lot. Um, as the editor-in-chief of a mental health recovery uh, online publication, and even just as, as the friend of people who are in the mental health community who are considering writing their essays. And here's what I tell them. Right, yeah, 
I don't know. Um, the only person who can answer the question, am I ready, is you. Um, I have heard people say that um, you shouldn't tell your mental health recovery story, particularly if it involves trauma, because um, that's jeopardizing you and putting you in a situation that you might not be able to handle. Well, here's what I'm gonna say to that. I don't know how any other person on God's green earth can think that they have some kind of authority to speak about whether you are ready to tell your mental health recovery story, no matter what you have been through. Um, I think that that is paternalistic and I think it is presumptuous and I think it is dangerous actually. Um, and what it really does is it silences you. By saying you're not ready, um, that is someone else taking ownership over your story and ownership over your voice. And I don't think that that should ever be allowed. Um, I think it's great that people have opinions and people can share them. Um, but the only person who knows if you're ready is you. So please remember that. Um, I think it's very good to seek feedback from, from people and, and different opinions and, and friends and family members. You know, what do you think? Do you think I'm at a point and talk to your therapist? Do you think I'm at a point where I'm ready to tell my story? Um, and these professionals or these friends and family can give you their opinions, but they can't give you an answer. Uh, the answer is yours and yours alone. So be asking yourself that question and be asking, your, be asking it of others, but only you can answer it. So really, I don't know um, if you're ready and maybe you don't either. And maybe this is why you're here at this webinar and I think that's wonderful. I thought I had done these so that these things all appeared one by one, but I guess not. Like I said, I'm a novice webinar. So here are some things to think about. And these are the potential negatives of sharing. Nothing on the internet goes away ever, okay, ever. Please, please, please remember that. Um, and I have, I have very open and frank and candid conversations with authors at the beginning of our relationship. Um, when someone reaches out to me and they send me an essay and I read it and I like it, um, I respond to them and sometimes the conversation happens where the writer will say, you know, I'm kind of on the fence about this. Um, like they've they've dipped their toe into the water and then after I come back at them and I say, listen, this is really great. I'd like to start on the publication process with you. Sometimes they want to take their toe out of the water. And that's totally OK. Um, and I'm very frank with people and I say, listen, you, you have to understand that this is going to be on the Internet forever. You can't reach out to me six months after publication and say, hey, I want this taken down. And actually, you can do that. Um, and I can take essays down from OC87 Recovery Diaries, but you have to understand the way the internet works. There are cached versions of old sites. So even if you take something down and someone does a search um, for your name, that essay can still show up. So just if you write it it's, and it's published online, think that it's there forever because it probably is. Uh, another negative, trolls. So people are going to try to hurt you. Um, and this is a very hard reality to come to terms with because it is a punishment for doing exactly what I've asked you to do, which is be open, be honest, be brave, be vulnerable, be true. And you're gonna say, okay, Gabe, I'm gonna do all of that and I'm gonna put myself out there. And, and basically, when you write your mental health recovery story, you're standing out there in the middle of a field with a big bullseye on your heart um, and your back, and you're asking for the arrows, and they will come. And that's a terrible thing to, um, to say, but in 2018 and in the world of social media and anonymity and avatars, People are hiding behind their screens and they will sling all kinds of arrows at you. Um, now, here's the thing about that. It's very important to put negative comments in the proper perspective. And um, 
I'm sure all the things that your parents and your teachers told you about playground bullies when you were young, well, they're going through things of their own, and it's not about you, it's about them, and sticks and stones and all of that stuff applies even as an adult. Um, so be thinking about those childhood life lessons that you were taught when your face was a little cut out in a wood block with nails around it spelling the word hope, okay? So think about that. Um, people have power over you if you let them. So negative comments and hurtful and abusive things that people can say online, um, they, they will come, uh, but they have power over you if you let them. And if you, if you let yourself be cowed by the cruelty of humanity, um, I, I consider that a great tragedy. Uh, and I consider it an extreme victory um, for those who let their voices ring out loud and strong and true in the face of trolls. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Sometimes those who may try to hurt you are not external. Um, sometimes they're internal and in your very close circle and they may be friends or family members. Um, when you speak about your mental illness, particularly if you haven't done so before, you uh, run the risk of alienating people who are, had been very close to you. Um, friends and family members may distance themselves from you. Um, they may shun you. Uh, they may even come at you with attacks. I mean, this will be extremely painful, and um, it's something to keep in mind. Uh, my relationship with my own mother, uh, I'll just disclose a little bit here, was put in real jeopardy um, when I started writing about my mental health. I, we, we lived in a family of, of shame and secrets, um, for sure. And depression and, and mental illness was not talked about um, when I was growing up. And so when you're, when you're talking about mental health challenges, you kind of can't not go there. Um, you know, because your family shapes who you are so much, you, you, they're going to come up. Um, and uh, fortunately, her reaction was was different than what I had anticipated. It was hard at first, um, but she's come around. So some folks may come around and, and some folks may not. Um, you will lose some amount of editorial control when you're putting your writing in the hands of others. Uh, most mental health publications and websites have editors. Um, OC87 Recovery Diary certainly does, and those editors will kind of open up your writing and tinker around a little bit there, and that may feel very uncomfortable, um, particularly if you're not used to professional writing and somebody else uh, having a say in, well, you know, this sentence needs to go, or this paragraph needs to go, or these thousand words need to go. So just keep in mind um, that what you send in initially is not what is going to be published, most likely. Uh, not in its entirety anyway. Uh, and also on the subject of uh, um, things on the internet stay there forever, past, present, and future employers slash romantic partners um, will Google you um, or Bing you or whatever they'll do to you. Um, but they, they're going to look you up. And when they put your name in, your mental health recovery essay is going to come up. And you need to think about um, your future employment prospects. And I hate, I hate, hate, hate that I have to say that because um, that's a bunch of nonsense in my mind. And um, people with mental illness should be just as employable as people who have no diagnosis. Um, but in, again, this is a world of stigma and this is a world of uh, kind of closed minds and closed systems sometimes and we have to deal with that. So if you're disclosing a mental health challenge through writing, you need to understand um, that that might make you less employable. So consider that before going forward. Now, I don't want to just sound like I'm talking about all the negatives because there are a ton of benefits to sharing your mental health recovery story. So here are some of the positives. Writing is cathartic and cathartis, catharsis means release. People love feeling a catharsis and that is why farting is so great. And see, you can combine the two, and that's wonderful. You can fart while writing your mental health recovery story. It's like a double win. And I just lost my entire audience. Um, but seriously, you will learn things about yourself that you never knew before. Um, sometimes when I'm sitting down to write, and, and I write a lot about mental health, um, and I've been doing it for a long time, 
I still have the ability to uh, cry while I'm writing, um, which says to me, I'm awakening something in myself that I didn't know was there before. Um, I have the ability to gasp uh, after writing a sentence. My God, I didn't know that was in there, right? Um, I think that surprising yourself and teaching yourself about yourself through exploring your own mental health recovery journey is incredibly rewarding. And that is just the tip of the iceberg because if you're moving yourself, you are going to move somebody else. Um, and speaking of somebody else and moving somebody else, you get connected to others in a very, very meaningful way uh, without ever leaving your home. The feedback that you will get on social media, it's not all going to be trolls. It is going to be people who are going to be standing up and applauding you. It is going to be people who, uh, people from your past who will come out of the woodwork um, when a piece of writing of yours gets posted and say, you know, I didn't know you were struggling like this and I wish I had known and P.S. I'm struggling too. And your disclosure made me feel like I wasn't alone. Um, I was very fortunate just two weeks ago to get an email um, to OC87 Recovery Diaries and it said um, something to the effect of you're doing wonderful work. I have no supports in my real life. Um, and coming to your site and reading, reading these essays makes me feel like I'm not alone. Um, and that was really powerful for me to read. And it was a very important reminder of why I do the work that I do, because I can lose sight of that sort of in the day to day of just things that you have to do in managing a publication. Um, those moments where people come out and say, this means something to me, uh, is incredibly important. So this is the other thing. Uh, this is a Mark Twain quote. Every, uh, you're required by law when doing a webinar um, to include a Twain quote. So this Twain quote, um, and I'll paraphrase it, change doesn't occur at the center. Change occurs at the edges in the lives of everyday folk. Um, and I truly, truly believe that. If you're waiting for change in the realm of mental health uh, or mental illness or destigmatization, if you're waiting for that change to come from Washington or uh, the EU or, or um, you know, the National Institute on Mental Health or whatever, um, you're going to be waiting a long time. Okay, SAMHSA, I'm sorry, that's not where change is coming from. Change is coming from you. Change is coming from me. Change is coming from people who take power into their own hands through writing, through saying, I'm not afraid uh, to talk about this. Um, by saying, uh, someone I love died by suicide. Saying, I have suicidal thoughts. Uh, saying, um, I have borderline personality disorder, God forbid. Uh, the, the biggest shame and, and stigma of, of mental health, right? Coming out there and disclosing a personality disorder like that, um, that is so misunderstood and so uh, misrepresented, not just in pop culture, it's barely represented in pop culture at all, but in the mental health um, sphere, in, the, in uh, mental health treatment, uh, it is misrepresented and misunderstood. So that's where change occurs. Change occurs by people telling their stories and supporting one another and criticizing each other. It's not all a mental health love fest. And so I think that's something else to know. You'll get criticism and criticism is different from trolling, but I think criticism is a positive when it's done in a constructive and supportive way that helps you grow um, as a writer. And that also helps you evolve in your own understanding of your mental health challenges and those of other people. Uh, so right, you're helping to destigmatize mental illness and and changing those changing that dialogue and that conversation at the edges, and you're also encouraging other people to do the same. Um, so there are for every mental health story that gets published, I don't know, there's a hundred thousand wallflowers out there who have similar stories um, who are just not ready. How do you get ready? Um, you get ready, I think, by largely experiencing other people and seeing, God, this other person did it. I can draw strength from that other person. Um, and it's that tipping point, that, that wallflower 
who has that beautiful story within them might need to read six personal essays. And then when they read the seventh, they're ready to go. That seventh could be yours. Uh, here are some more things to consider when you're thinking about writing your mental health uh, essay. Does the website pay? Wipe that uh, stuff off your keyboard. I know, we all love money. Money's great. It helps us buy things and save up to buy more things. Um, so yeah, think about that. Uh, be looking at websites, be looking at their submission guidelines. Um, they should say up front if they pay or not. Um, I will tell you that it's rare that uh, a mental health publication pays. Um, OC87 Recovery Diaries does pay. We're very, very fortunate to be in a position that we can pay our contributors. We pay a $250 honorarium for a published essay. Um, we do not publish everything that we receive. Um, and neither does any publication, so um, please know that. But yeah, um, the reason that we pay, first of all, is because we can, and second of all, we believe in disclosure, and we believe that vulnerability should be rewarded. Um, so you're stepping forward and you're putting yourself out there while, and you're going through the editorial process, which is kind of rigorous um, at OC87 Recovery Diaries, we believe that you should get something um, for that. Um, think about whether the website is a nonprofit or a for-profit. Um, this may make a difference to you, this may not make a difference to you, um, and that's a totally a personal decision. There are some people who like to really enmesh themselves in the nonprofit kind of touchy-feely, feel-good world. Um, other people don't care, and that's totally fine. Uh, will you work with an editor? Right. As I said, uh, most publications have editors. Um, not only will you work with an editor though, but how closely. Um, I can speak to OC87 Recovery Diaries, obviously because I was an editor there and now editor-in-chief, and I still work, I still have a caseload of writers with whom I work. So the way it works here is a writer sends their essay. Um, if we don't like it, uh, or if it's not appropriate for the site, we don't write back, simply because of the volume of stuff that we receive. We can't respond to everyone. Uh, if we do think it's uh, worthy of publication, we will write back and let the writer know that. And um, then I or the other editors, uh, whoever's assigned to the piece, start editing. And editing consists of grammar and punctuation and uh, paragraph structure and all that kind of mundane stuff that is unfortunately necessary um, in storytelling. But it's also... Um, I will ask questions of writers. I will say, um, I thought this was really interesting. Why don't you go further with this? Uh, if you're in therapy, describe the room. What's your therapist wearing? Um, I want to know details. Now, I don't want to necessarily know details about traumatic experiences or potentially uh, triggering incidents uh, or uh, suicide attempts and things like that. I'm talking about detail that helps bring your story alive. Um, if you're going in a direction that we think is not um, helpful, we will guide you. Uh, that's what the editorial process is. And um, a lot of times it takes two or three revisions uh, to get to where both you and the editor feel, yes, the piece is now ready for publication. Uh, some sites that, that I've submitted to and that I've been published on, um, they don't do much. Um, you know, there's an editor there, but the editor really doesn't do much. The editor inserts hyperlinks, um, they put up a stock image, and that's fine. That, that's what it is. But you need to know up front what is the relationship going to be between the writer and the editor, so you know what to expect. Um, what kind of readership or social media following does the site have? That's very important. So you're going to be putting yourself out there, and you want to know what kind of audience is this piece potentially going to have. Uh, does the website have comments, or can people only comment on social media? Uh, is it easy to share? Look through the other content on the site. Well, how many views does this piece get? Uh, do these pieces get? How many shares do they get? Um, how many fans or followers or likes uh, does the website have on social media? And do the posts have? Be thinking about all of those things. You can't just think as a creative person. You also have to think as a business person um, when you're writing. And and when you're writing, you're your business. So take care of your business um, and put yourself in front of the audience that you think you should be in front of. Um, make sure also that your style is a good match. 
So sometimes I will get submissions that are very academic and they will have footnotes and endnotes and citations and uh, you know bibliography at the end. Sorry, I'm not interested. Um, it may be very erudite and it may be very well written, um, but that's not for that's not for my website, right? Um, I'm interested in personal stories um, of mental health recovery. So find out what the mission of the site is, read some of their content and make sure that your content is, is congruent with theirs and that the audience is, is really worth your time and effort. Uh, this is also very important. Will you retain the rights to your story? Um, so for some sites, you put your story up there, that's it. It's an exclusive and it can't go on any other site. That's the arrangement with recovery diaries and we do that for a lot of different reasons. Um, some people like that, some people do not like that. Um, some people want to be able to submit their essay other places. So just make sure you know what you're getting into. Um, you know, buyer beware. May you write and publish anonymously. So I get this question um, every now and then. At OC87 Recovery Diaries, you cannot. Um, I can't publish an essay by Gabriel N. Uh, or by uh, Throat Wobbler Mangrove. That's a Monty Python joke. I don't know. You probably don't know what I'm talking about. But that's OK. Um, what I'm saying is, is you can't use uh, a last initial and you can't use a pseudonym. And the reason why is, we are all about busting stigma, and we do not believe that mental illness should live in shadows. We believe that mental illness should be out there and that we should be talking about it. And to be doing that in an authentic way, it's kind of counterintuitive to that mission if you're using a pseudonym or writing you know, by anonymous. Um, and of course, that comes with all those potential problems that I mentioned in slide three, I think it was, um, but, Again, that's something that you really need to think about. How much should you tell? Again, that is a very personal decision. Um, but what I will tell you is you are not telling your whole recovery story in one essay. You are telling a portion of your story. Um, so think about what is that piece that is interesting to you that you think would be interesting to others. Um, that little nugget, that little kernel of a story, um, what is that little aspect of your life and recovery that you want to tell, and how can you relate it to the whole of your existence? Okay, so here's some, some howdy-do's. Um, write the kind of essay that you would want to read. I mentioned that already. Um, consider your audience, but consider yourself more. Um, think about what you are hoping to achieve through your essay. Um, if you, I don't know, if you set out with this sort of lofty mission, I'm going to bust stigma through my essay, I don't know, chances are you're probably not going to achieve that mission. But if your mission is to help somebody else maybe feel not so alone, um, that's a mission that you can absolutely achieve um, through writing. Be an active participant in the sharing of your work and others. So. I think that creating a community is so important um, around mental health advocates and people who are writing and telling their stories. We've got to be there for one another. And like I said, not just with yay, you, but also with constructive feedback and criticism. So be out there, be out there on social media, be commenting on other people's journeys, um, be reading other people's work, email them, reach out to them. I, I was so moved um, by the way you know you talked about that first time you were sitting in the guidance counselor's office and you broke down, and that meant so much to me. I wish I had had the bravery to do that in high school. That will mean so much to that person. And, you know, that's it's paying it forward. It will happen to you too. Um, okay, so it's at the top now. Well, anyway, um, please write a cover letter um, when you send your essay in to an editor. Um, it's kind of, it's a little irritating. It's like sending your resume with no cover letter. Um, take a little bit of time and just write an introductory letter uh, about yourself. It doesn't have to be long. Just a paragraph or two will do. Trust me. It will go a long way to getting you in the good graces of whoever is receiving your email. Um, familiarize yourself with the style, tone, and length of the essays. Uh, I mentioned that already. Way to go, Gabe. Ah, humor. 
Yes. So mental illness and mental health challenges, those are serious, right? We shouldn't joke about that stuff. Wrong. Um, there's a difference between making fun and infusing an essay with humor. Um, a thousand words, 1200 words, 1500 words, 2000 words, that's a lot for people to read. Um, a way for you to endear yourself to a reader is to put a little bit of humor every now and then. Don't be afraid of it. it it's okay. And you would want to read an essay with some humor in it as well. Um, please look your essay over before sending it. Don't think, well, I'm sending this to an editor so they can just deal with the fact that uh, I wrote a thousand words and inserted no paragraph breaks and PS, every fourth word is underlined in red. No. Please tell your own story, um, not somebody else's story. Your story is what you know your best. Tell that. Pull no punches. I said it before, I'll say it again, and I'm gonna say it when I get asked questions. Uh, here are some acts of don'ts real quick. Um, don't sling a bunch of caca. Gabe Howard said I couldn't curse during this, so um, it's good I put an exclamation point in there because no one knows what that actually says. Um, don't try to like blow your own trumpet or tell me all about how mental illness is your superpower or uh, talk about uh, you know how how great it is. Um, it, it's not great. Be open and be honest, um, and be honest with yourself. Um, Ask yourself questions while you're writing. Is this really what I want to be saying? Is this really how I want to be putting this? Um, is this the right word? Is there a better word? Um, is this going to make a difference? Is this going to matter to me enough to risk telling my story? Ask yourself questions. Oh, balls. I hit two things. Oop, and I said balls. Oh, well. Um, please don't start your essay with, I'm Gabriel Nathan and I live with depression. No, 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 no. Start with a hook. Here's an essay that was on OC87 Recovery Diaries that published a couple weeks ago. My brother used to wake me up in the middle of the night to hunt for ninjas. That is the way you start an essay. That is an essay that you want to keep reading, okay? Um, listen to the advice of others. Don't, don't listen to the advice of others to the exclusion of your own intuition. Again, you know yourself best, you know your own readiness and your own level of comfort. So take what people have to tell you, evaluate it, think critically about it, and then put it into its proper context and roll with your bad self. Please don't just write for money. Please don't do that. Um, if you do that, I guarantee you the writing is gonna be inauthentic and flat and not interesting. And you may very well get on a roll and you may very well make some money. I don't know that it's going to be enough to live off of, but then again, maybe you like cans of baked beans and uh, that's fine. Um, but right from the soul, right from the heart, um, and hopefully the money will come. Again, I mentioned this before, you're just focusing on a moment. Use vocabulary that's within your um, comfort zone. And don't write like a therapist, especially if you are one. Um, this is, we've gotten essays from therapists and they're wonderful. Um, you, sometimes I get an essay that's a little too therapist-y, a little bit too didactic, a little bit, I'm gonna teach you um, about mental health recovery. No, you're not teaching anybody anything. You are learning about yourself at the, at the same time that the reader is learning about you. Um, mental health writing and, and recovery writing is much more exploratory um, than it is teaching, I think. Um, yeah, I would definitely stay away from advice. You don't want to be responsible um, for somebody doing something that you said in your essay um, and then having a negative consequence and have that come back on you. You definitely don't want that. Um, your mental health recovery journey is your own. And whether it's meds, whether it's meds and therapy, whether it's just therapy, whether it's yoga, whether it's Reiki, whether it's um, any combination of uh, God knows what, your mental health recovery is valid and interesting and important. And there's something in there that someone else can benefit from it. So don't worry 
that it doesn't fit into some kind of category. Um, write about it anyway. Don't be afraid. I can't emphasize that enough. Um, if you are ready, go for it. And how will you know if you're ready? Right. You have just as much of a chance of figuring it out with the Magic 8 Ball um, as you do asking a bunch of questions to other people. Um, just go into yourself and you'll figure it out. Websites to consider. So OC87 Recovery Diaries, duh. Uh, Psych Central uh, is a wonderful site and they accept a lot um, of fantastic essays on their blog. Uh, the Mighty is a lot of people's go-to source for um, writing about all kinds of um, health challenges, not just mental health. Uh, health Central, uh, NAMI has a wonderful blog um, where they publish wonderful stories about uh, mental health recovery. Um, and of course, there's also that option that you might want to consider, I don't know, just saying, um, if you want to do the heart over the eye, just write Gabriel instead of Gabe. That way, um, it'll be an eye for you. Um, and so that's about it. I am done and I am hoping that you enjoyed this webinar and I would love to answer some of your questions. Gabriel, thank you so much. We appreciate your humor as well as your attempts at humor. So that wow. was very awesome. Burn. <laughs> Thanks, Gabe. <laughs> it's good to have you. So we have some uh, questions uh, popping in here. So you wanna, hit, you wanna hit the ground running? Yes. The first question is, I think this is a good place to start. It said, why would we not write for money? Don't we need to eat? Uh, yeah, everyone needs to eat. Um, so I think what I said was don't write just for the money. Um, I think there are a lot of reasons to do things. And I think that if writing is the way that you want to make money, that's great. Um, but there's a difference between living your life and telling your mental health recovery story as an occasional writer, right? Um, and having some kind of other existence and deciding like, this is what I'm going to do. I am just going to write my mental health recovery story. That's a very different thing. So that's saying that I'm going to live as a professional writer. And I'm going to tell you that that is not something that 99.999% of the general public is able to achieve, okay? So that's a cold, hard reality that you have to confront, um, that you may not, I don't know, have the writing chops to make it as a professional writer to earn your living solely based off of writing. So yeah, you have to eat, and I might suggest a career that is a little bit more stable um, than professional writing if your your main worry is eating and surviving. Perfect. Thank you so much, Gabriel. And then we have a message here that, that I love. It says, thanks for a great webinar. It's hard to believe it's your first one. What a nice sense of humor and a lively delivery. Have a great day. Oh, that's very sweet. Have a great day too. It was definitely my first webinar. Um, and I'm probably going to have to change my pants. Um, <laughs> so. well, you were honestly very, very, you were, you were, you were fantastic. As you know, I, I host these monthly for Psych Central, and I can honestly say that you have been the best one this month. Fantastic, hands down, simply incredible. Yeah. So I guess that means there's no more questions. <laughs> <laughs> nope, nope. We're, we're giving everybody a second to pop them in here. Uh, I'm sure there'll be another question or two. Do you have any questions that you would like to answer, Gabe? Um. I mean, you probably would have just put it in your presentation. I, yeah, I probably would have. Um, Someone uh, actually wrote, wait a minute, both of your names are Gabe. Yes. <laughs> yeah, why do you think I'm doing this? That's the only reason he asked me to do this. <laughs> First name. That's, that's it. Um, I don't know. I guess the question that, that uh, comes up for me sometimes is, um, how did you start? Meaning, how, you know, how did I start kind of mental health storytelling? And um, kind of a narcissistic 
I'm asking myself a question about how I started. This is kind of like when I was a little boy and I used to pretend that I was on 60 Minutes and I would pretend that I was Mike Wallace interviewing myself in the mirror. It was really, it was a, it was a painful childhood for many reasons. Um, but how, how I got started in mental health writing, um, I've written for years, um, for a very, very, very long time. And my first grade report card, and I swear to God, this is gonna sound really stupid, but first grade, Mr. Barrett, my mother still has all my report cards. And um, Mr. Barrett's comment on my first grade report card was I love Gabe's creative writing. Um, and I, I looked at that recently and I thought it was really funny because I'm like, what the hell kind of creative writing was I doing at, at seven years old? But um, I started telling my, my mental health stories um, on OC87 Recovery Diaries when I was just a part-time editor. And I was working at a psychiatric hospital and I was kind of fumbling my way through therapy. And um, uh, Bud Clayman, who was the editor-in-chief at the time, um, he's now the publisher of the site, asked me one day, he said, would you consider writing an essay about uh, men's mental health in America? And I was like, oh my God, um, I don't know what to say about men's mental health in America, but I do know what to say about my own mental health. And um, I guess by writing about my own journey, and the essay was called Suffering in Silence, uh, Men's Mental Health in America, um, by extension, I was writing about others through writing about myself and writing about the kind of stifling stigma and silence that I grew up with and that I was wrestling with as an adult and I found the experience of writing that essay to be a tremendous release and um, something that was, was very helpful to me. And I was very surprised at the, at the reaction that it got uh, in a good way. So that's how I got started. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Gabriel. Another question did come in. It, it said that from your perspective, from your vantage, it says, okay, let me just read it exactly. From your vantage point, are there more positive comments than negative ones? It seems like we only hear about the negative ones. Uh, yes, I think overwhelmingly um, the responses are positive. Um, and, you know, just keep in mind, there are going to be lots of people who are going to read your essay who are going to say nothing. Um, they're not going to comment. They're not going to hit the thumbs up on Facebook. They're sitting at their desk um, at a job in some cubicle somewhere in America or beyond um, reading your personal essay and they're moved internally, but they may not always be moved to speak. So there's this whole thing in, in Quakerism, right? You're supposed to stand at, at or uh, you're supposed to stand if the spirit moves you, right? Um, well, the spirit might be moving them and they may be standing in a metaphorical sense, but you might not see it. So I think that's really important to, to understand. Um, but I think that the comments that, that do come out, um, I think are overwhelmingly positive and just know that you're, you're making an impact on people, whether they say it or not. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And this question is for me, Gabe. I don't want to try to convince you it's from the audience, but uh, my question is, do you regret telling your story? You, you told about some pushback from your friends and family, specifically your mother, um, from where you are today. Do you regret it or are you happy that you, you shared your story? I've never, never regretted anything um, that I've written. And I have faced some, uh, I have faced some consequences that I really don't want to, I don't, I don't really feel like discussing here. Sure. But I have faced consequences that have been very, very painful. Um, to me. One thing I will share, um, my aunt and uncle uh, stopped speaking to me for uh, six, seven years. In fact, my aunt is still not speaking to me. Um, and this was a personal essay that I wrote about uh, when I was, I worked as an emergency medical technician um, from 2005 to 2007. And I wrote a personal essay about aging and dementia and um, kind of losing your faculties. And in the essay, I talk about how my paternal grandparents both died of vascular dementia. And I talked about, uh, they were living in Australia at the time. And my grandfather had passed away. And my father said, okay, that's it. You have to go meet 
your grandmother now. En enough, enough is enough. You have to meet her before she dies, right? And my grandmother's name is Nava. And in Hebrew, the word Nava means beautiful. And I wrote in this essay, um, I met my grandmother or something like that. Uh, her name is Nava, which means beautiful. Although she wasn't quite beautiful when I met her, she more resembled a raisin um, in a pair of glasses. And my aunt and uncle um, blasted me. I mean, like, <laughs> came at me with the fury of a thousand Israelis um, and uh, tore me to shreds and saying that I had disrespected their mother and how could I, how could I do something like that and take it down? And P.S. I didn't take it down. Um, and so, like I said, my aunt is still not speaking to me. My uncle recently um, kind of extended an olive branch just last year. Um, and this was years and years ago that I wrote this. Um, but I don't regret it because uh, the, the essay was published by a, um, an online publication called Backstory. And there's, uh, I guess the last time I looked was maybe like a year or two ago, there's like 25 beautiful comments about people who have experienced uh, dementia in their families and loss and were emotionally moved by the essay. And that's what matters. Uh, touching people and moving people matters. And if there are people out there who can't handle it, um, whether they're your family or they're your friends, um, that's just tough. And, and it, it, it's tough for them. And yeah, it's tough for me too. But um, there's immense power in connecting with people. And um, some people are just afraid of that. And uh, that's either going to get resolved or it's not. And I hope that if your personal essay causes you pain or turmoil, um, that it's temporary. I guess that's, that's just my hope. Wonderful. Gabriel, thank you so much. We really appreciate you being here. Can you give us the website for OC87 Recovery Diaries one more time, please? Sure. It is OC87RecoveryDiaries.org. And um, we have new personal essays every single Wednesday. Um, so check it out. And if you're ready, you're ready. And if you're not, maybe next month. It's okay. All right. My name is Gabe Howard on behalf of PsychCentral.com. You have been watching this month's webinar series, and we will see you next month. Thanks, everyone. Bye.